So those of you who are out in the hall or those of you who are still on your feet, if you could let people know that we're beginning and uh, encourage everyone to come and take a seat. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of pieces of, of business. And Jamie, do you need to start with any business? OK, good. Uh, a couple of things. So uh, just quickly, I want to uh, make two, um, two significant acknowledgments. And I'll start with one while people are gathering. Uh, I just I think the role of the presentations of the art has been so important to the quality of the conversation that we're having and the sense of the experience that we're having. And I wanted to just um, acknowledge the work of the technical crew here um, that <laughs> They pride themselves on never being seen, uh, but they do exist, and feel free to thank them when you see them. But we've got our uh, technician in the booth, Vijay's there, Tarina and her crew on the stage. So I just wanted to uh, be sure and thank them. I want to also, uh, just a quick thing about the process. I think you are starting to feel it. I want you to trust it. We, we, we believe deeply in it. And so I really uh, appreciate your continued uh, participation and active participation in it. But I think you can feel that the conversations are starting to acquire a kind of, um, uh, there are themes that have arisen, there are uh, questions that are now in the air that will ultimately need to be answered. Um, and there are, uh, there's anxiety which I love about what do we do with it when we leave here, what happens? Uh, just take a look at the agenda and you'll notice that on Sunday, tomorrow, we spend quite a bit of time in that question of now what? We're in affinity-based breakout groups, we're looking at what can we do, what are we going to take away from here, then we have individual opportunities to reflect on that. So continue right now to gather the questions, please, uh, and then bring them into those breakouts tomorrow about, I heard this, I'd like to know more about that, uh, there was a list that went by yesterday of resources, we'll get to some networks at this table. These things are being gathered, um, and tomorrow will be the moment to capture what you're going to do as you leave. So maintain this space of being open to influence. I loved that, uh, that formulation, Liz. Uh, and then uh, a, a reminder on the, the circle, we talked here about uh, talking together, talking to each other. And on the circle, if you could make sure that, you're, that your listening is active. I know many of you are taking notes on your computers. That's um, taking your notes, keeping your questions is great. Try to stay off your email. If you need to make, take a phone call or be on email, go ahead and leave the room. It's probably better than doing it in the room, okay? Uh, and so my last acknowledgement before we jump in is I just think there were people who weren't here yesterday and we are here for a second day. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Massachusetts and Wampanoag people, and pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and I invite you to do the same for one moment. Thank you. And then we have one other um, surprise in the agenda, which is that this table would like to start with the singing of the national anthem. Thank you. 
<laughs> so you've seen how this works. The introductions will go this way at the request of one of the. Oh no, you wanted to go this way. Oh, I thought you wanted me to go the other way. Okay, so we're going to uh, pretend I'm timing you. Carl's much better with his timer than I am, so pretend Carl is timing you, and we'll do we'll do one minute each as we as we go around. Okay, I'm Melissa Walker. I'm the Healing Arts Program Coordinator at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence in Bethesda, Maryland. It's on the base of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. I've worked very closely with a lot of you, um, and most of you know that I have to say that the opinions expressed in a moment are the, mine alone and not those of the Department of Defense or federal government. Um, I just want to—I want to say, as you guys all know, I'm, pr I'm usually pretty vocal. I've been very quiet. <laughs> My brain has not been. Uh, I, I'm very fortunate. Um, I feel very fortunate for the discussions that have occurred and, and what's about to happen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that landscape that came up and um, just remind you that I have been immersed in the clinical realm for the last eight and a half years um, through our wonderful partnership with National Endowment for the Arts and the work I've been doing with Captain McGuire. Um, I have had exposure to artists coming both into the clinical setting and, in, and then out in the community setting. Um, but this is very new to me. Um, also, I have to go back to something Liz Lerman said yesterday about how the continuum is a circle um, and that a lot of the service members we work with and veterans are going to be coming in and out of the clinical space and into the community space and then back again. So I would like to address um, how we do that safely and how we work together and then also um, and wonderful point made earlier, learn each other's languages. Um, one thing I will point out is the name of this panel. <laughs> Military, uh, military healthcare practitioners, VA, and art therapist perspective. So there are music therapists at this table as well. And if you're talking about us in an umbrella way, we are creative arts therapists. So I want to acknowledge that they're at the table, and it's not just art therapists here. So. Great. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Wong. I'm a pediatrician and a musician and live in the space of the intersection between art and medicine. I have um, uh, worked with music therapists. I'm a musician myself that does medicine and um, ran an orchestra of medical uh, professionals, the Longwood Symphony, for about 20 years. I'm still a member. But um, what I think is really interesting is that we all have a place at the table. The medical professionals who are artists, the um, artists who want to be working in healing spaces, as well as the the people who are learning to heal through their art. And um, there is a space for all of that. There's going to be tension at the edges, but um, it's where that tension lies, where growth happens the greatest. And I think that's uh, something that we have to just sort of accept and, and just listen a little harder whenever we get to those tensions. I think empathy and compassion, um, comfort with ambiguity. These are the things we're teaching our medical students as a sort of a preventive way of moving the, the field forward so the next generation will understand this even better than we do. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so, <clears throat> so Captain Maura McGuire. Um, I, my current position is Assistant Chief for Internal Medicine at Walter Reed. I'm also lead for Integrative Health and Wellness. Um, my entire life has been in the arts, and I started underneath the piano when my dad taught voice lessons at home on Saturdays, um, and it has never stopped. My mom's artwork and her plays, and, um, and so much like Melissa, my head is spinning a little bit because there's a heaviness, but there's also an excitement and a lot of thoughts and ideas, so I'm going to try to express myself as clearly as I can. Lisa just mentioned something that I find interesting when we talk about these gaps or the intersection between arts and medicine. And I think, well, if it's an intersection, it's like saying, oh, well, we're gonna talk to you about people and patients. I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure patients are people. Like, you know, these are the exact same things. Um, and so I feel as though, you know, um, there needs to be a shift in the way we message things um, and that some paradigms need to be completely destroyed because they're not even true. Um, and, it, and it hurts and harms our ability to do some really important work. So, um, but I'll elaborate on it later, so thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Michelle Stefanelli and I'm part of the VA caregiver program which is out of central office. Um, Washington, D.C., and this program works with uh, post-9-11 veterans, families, 
caregivers and their um, families. I am um, really delighted to have been invited here by Jane and the group um, to really um, talk about the network and of available services and partnerships that are already um, embarked with uh, the Veterans Administration and the community. And I'll address that in a little bit, so thank Great. you. Sorry, Sarah, before you go, can I also say that there's nothing that I say today that represents the views of the DOD or the government? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Sarah Cass, and I am retired from the military, so I no longer need to give that disclaimer. <laughs> My views are mine and mine alone, and nobody else is claiming them. But um, I, um, I come here today uh, sometimes feeling like an imposter, but yet uh, deeply interested in the work that's happening here. I retired from the Navy two years ago after 23 years of service, the last few years uh, working specifically at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence with Melissa and Rebecca and uh, Bill O'Brien from the NEA on this NEA military healing arts partnership that we now call the Creative Forces Network. When I retired, and, and prior to that, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see all this come together because prior to that I worked at the headquarters for Navy Medicine on wounded warrior policy and helped bring uh, reentry to military bases across the Marine Corps and the Navy. And it's exciting to see the great work uh, going on with that. Um, but when I retired from the military, I had a choice of what I wanted to do, and what was most important to me was to bring the things that were working uh, in healthcare to help veterans, service members, and their families heal from these invisible wounds of war. Um, and I had seen the incredible power of the healing arts, both in the clinical setting as well as community engagement, and wanted to uh, help promote that and foster that. And so that's why I work as a consultant to the NEA in helping to expand that partnership. So Great. thanks for letting me be here today. Great. So <clears throat> I'm Jeremy Nobel, and uh, I'm a, a general internist and also um, with the Foundation for Art and Healing, also uh, a poet. So I'm looking at this wonderful conversation from lots of perspectives. Um, so the Foundation for Art and Healing is a nonprofit. It's been around 14 years. And we explore and promote the idea that creative arts expression improves health and well-being. And we do that in three areas. One is creating awareness to people for whom it is not immediately obvious, like the people in this room. But I'm happy to say that most people find it an appealing idea and can rapidly move towards it when you actually put the idea in front of them. So we do a lot of awareness work. We also develop innovative programs of various kinds to actually bring creative expression opportunities to people. And then we also do research. And in many ways, I think that is kind of the anchor of our identity as an organization to try to bridge growing neurophysiologic research and understanding about what's going on in the brain with creative expression. And then what we can make available to people in, uh, in their communities, uh, either directly or through groups. The big, and I'm here today 100% um, because of an accidental encounter with Bill O'Brien uh, about six years ago. It was a convening like this on a, on a related topic on design and healthcare, and Bill said, you should come see what we're doing. <laughs> and I rapidly met uh, Melissa and uh, Captain McGuire, and it's been a terrific partnership, you know, working with that great energy. Because there's so many clinicians around the table, I thought I'd, I'd just share a little bit about kind of our newest initiative and in focus, which is really to look at loneliness and isolation as a public health challenge. I, uh, I'll say it, I'll kind of make a bet now, within two or three years, you're going to be hearing about loneliness and isolation as, as the public health challenge that's going to replace obesity, is what everyone talks about. I know that because you're already hearing about it on NPR, which means it's like the, the leading edge of things. <laughs> And I, and I think we're generally aware that loneliness and isolation is a challenge on the, on the mental health or the behavioral health side through the classic triad of, of increased risk for depression, substance abuse, and suicide. One of the reasons we started focusing on it was growing epidemiologic work that came out in 2014, showing that there's something about the lonely brain or the isolated brain that, prob that um, because of increase in inflammatory response and reduction in immune response, has a 30% increase of early mortality, totally separate from suicide and substance abuse, but because of cardiovascular risk, heart disease and stroke, and um, uh, immune deficiency, you know, which leads to oncologic risk and, to a certain extent, other disorders. And so the net aggregate risk for lonely, being lonely and isolated is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 
and yet as a society, we don't react to it. We don't talk about it. We don't put it to that level of uh, awareness, attention, and commitment of resource. So we've taken it on. We've launched the Unloneliness Project uh, in partnership with AFTA and some others. And uh, we launched it last May. And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we do a lot of awareness generating and programs. So to generate um, awareness, we actually are doing an online film festival on loneliness and isolation. Now, I didn't take the marketing course uh, in medical school, but we knew we shouldn't call it the, unlone or the Lonely Isolated Film Festival. I'm looking at you. If we wanted three people minutes. to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's the Creatively Connected Film Festival, and we'll talk more about it, because I think it, it will lead to empathy and some of the other kind yeah, of activities exactly. we're talking about. Great. Hey, I'm Rebecca Vaudre. Um, I am a music therapist for Creative Forces. Thank you, Melissa, for pointing out that clarification on the screen. Um, I work alongside Melissa. Am I being too soft? Talk to us. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, I work alongside. We'll I work alongside Melissa at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. Um, also, been working with Creative Forces on the expansion project, which I'm very grateful for the opportunity, and we'll be moving um, to California. Um, which is exciting next week to start developing this in other areas. Um, as a Mass Native um, and being at this table with some colleagues I've gone to grad school with, and I did get my bachelor's of music therapy at Berkeley right around the corner. Um, did my grad school at Harvard uh, University. And um, I'm a music therapist, I'm a musician. And I, this is my community and it always will be, it's my home. And I think I only got here today, um, but just by engaging in that anthem and hearing everyone at this table and everyone in the room sing, um, I feel very connected right now more than ever from this morning, um, even being a tardy participant to the, uh, to the convening, just from that music making experience. So I think that's a really, um, that says a lot about community building um, through even you know, a small few minute piece, very powerful piece. Great, thank you Rebecca, welcome. Hello, I'm Brittany Costa. Um, I'm a musician, I am an arts administrator, and I'm in the military. So I'm here today with Berklee College of Music. I found, about the, I found out about the convening from Rebecca, so thank you. Um, I am the department coordinator there, and we are trying to grow our program so that we can reach out more to the military and veteran community. Um, we're trying to expand because it's what we feel we need to do. It's a very important community that should experience um, music therapy and it's already happening at Walter Reed and a lot of other veterans organizations um, and a lot of our students are expressing the wanting to be involved in that in that population um, so we're hoping to partner with more local organizations veteran hospitals uh, other universities where they have stu a veteran student population um, to train our students with professional music therapy facilitators that way we are training our students to have the knowledge of that population, the knowledge of how to work with that population, and um, also contribute to the community by providing more music therapy outlets for them. Um, through that, we're going to research and evaluate, so that way we can provide data to establish more funding, um, because foundations love data. <laughs> and um, we don't think that we need to prove the val validity, but Western medicine thinks that we do, so we're gonna to continue to do that, and that way we can create sustainability through our programming. Okay. Um, on, a, on the other side, my military experience, I've been in for 11 years um, in the Army Band, uh, but I also did five years active duty in a military healthcare facility. I'm Scott Engel, a psychologist over at Fort Hood. I do need to, again, sort of the caveat, uh, the views that I express are not the views of the DOD, but they are exclusively my own. So now that that's an aside, uh, I am a civilian and I am not an artist, so why am I here? Um, so that's, that poses a, a, an important question. It's been somewhat uncomfortable at times. Um, you know, I, and if my mother is watching, you know, at, at the sixth grade recital, I wasn't really playing the clarinet. I pretended. Um, so. Um, so now it's out. Um, but uh, I have the privilege of being the uh, director at the Intrepid Spirit Center uh, at Fort Hood, Texas. There are five in the country, and uh, we're very unique, uh, uniquely situated. We are a private-public partnership with DOD and the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund. We have four separate sections where we're treating the service member holistically. We have a medical section, a rehab section, a pain section, a psychological health section. I have over 50 assets within that footprint, and somehow I get to be the director of that, so it's quite a privilege. Uh, we have recently partnered with NEA and are now expanding some of the BH services to include art therapy. 
And uh, part of the challenge that I face is intuitively understanding as a psychodynamically trained psychologist the value of art and the projection and the utility in art, how to convince my staff that there is value added here. So it starts internally and then just trying to understand that, well, eventually they're gonna have to get on the boat or they won't be able to necessarily stay because this is where we're going. But it is, it's, um, it, it, there's a richness to this that I think has to be explained to our staff so people understand it. It's getting our service members exposed to art therapy and then eventually building bridges into the community so they can get out of the bunker and get back into the community and be, re be engaged. Um, I'll stop there. Great, okay, thank you. All right, uh, hi, I'm Bill O'Brien. I'm the Senior Advisor for Innovation to the Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. And I come to this table with a sense of all my worlds colliding. And I think it's worth laying out because I think there's a shift in value that I experienced that's worth me bringing forward at this conversation. Uh, I spent about 15 of my first adult years as a theater making practitioner, performing on stages in 48 states, um, writing and composing music for national tours, then becoming a producer for Deaf West Theater. Uh, then about 10 years ago, I came to the National Endowment for the Arts, witnessed the birth of HowlRound, <laughs> uh, and was the theater and musical theater director for about three years. And then for about six, seven years now, I've been working on uh, setting up a program innovation office. And we look a lot at the intersection of art science, uh, nature of creativity in the brain, that kind of thing, but also arts and health and military was the other thing that I was uh, given a task to, to consider, and I realized it all came together in one fell swoop up at the NICO when I started to hear about the kind of patient-centered care that they were doing. Um, and I think the, the reason I wanted to bring this forward is that um, as a practitioner and as the experience uh, that I've had as, a, as, as pursuing art as a calling, as a vocation, there's a set of core values that I think we all sort of understood, and, that, and there are things like freedom of speech, um, the resistance of content shaping, um, not allowing your art to be used as a reduced utility for some other purpose. Um, and I think if there's one thing that's been a really interesting shift in my mind uh, as we work in a very patient-centered, person-centered way, it's to think again about who is an artist and what's the purpose of that art. And when you really put it into a, 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 a specific purpose where you are locking arms with a team of people, uh, and you are bringing arts to the table to confront a societal concern that, that a lot of people care about, um, those values need to be reconsidered. Um, it's okay to, to be thinking about the art as a utility, um, to be thinking about uh, we're bringing arts into play as, a, as an important player in the role uh, of the effort to confront the most vexing invisible wounds of war. Um, I think it's a very powerful thing. It, it, it really reintegrated, re-energized my sense of what art means to me, who does it, where it happens. Um, another couple great. Of that. That's a great place to begin. And uh, Sarah, I'm going to come to you. Uh, one of the things that I've been... I said I was the imposter. Yeah, right, that's why. <laughs> one of the things that uh, has sort of arisen in the earlier conversations, it, there seems to be a kind of... Uh, three different areas have surfaced really in terms of the utility of this work. So, so we all gathered out of a sense that this work is A, happening, and B, matters. That's right. the whole room can share that. But then I've heard this kind of divergence about how uh, and, and why. And uh, the area that is striking me is that we, we've been talking about cultural diplomacy, some that just uh, surfaced recently as you know the utility of art in, in the military as a uh, tool of cultural diplomacy. We've also talked about it as a healing tool. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it as civics literacy. Yeah. And uh, I have, a, and anybody can jump in, but I wanted to ask you specifically, Sarah, uh, is, this, um, is it important, do you, do you think, that we are clear at the outset are we doing all three at once? Do we need to be focused on whether which we're doing and which ones we're not doing? How much is it, how important is it to be clear um, from your perspective yeah. as we enter it? Thanks. I, I think it's really important that we're very clear of what our intention is at the outset. That doesn't mean that there aren't sometimes um, unintended, consequ unintended consequences of something that happens. Um, and I can give a very clear example um, from my time at the NICO when uh, Melissa was engaged with our patients doing a mask making uh, uh, 
uh, therapeutic intervention. And it very clearly, the intent of doing that is a very specific healing intention for an individual patient. But one of the things that we did there is we started to display the masks in that center um, in a way that I think really importantly invited others into engaging in their own therapy. They realized that when they walked into that studio and they saw the masks of other people, that they were not alone, that they could go with others and take that risk of engaging in therapy. And so what started as an individual therapeutic encounter mm -hmm. could be used in a way, almost unintentionally, to invite others into therapy. And then I think the last part of that same thing that gets at sort of the civic um, discourse on this initiative is um, these same masks became sort of an interest to National Geographic. And a, uh, a, uh, a spread in National Geographic was done, uh, highlighting some of the work with the masks that I think, as I would have to sit there and justify the cost of this facility, I would talk about the value of what happened in the facility of really helping to educate society about what 15 years of war looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredibly important. It's a lot of what I've heard here in this room the, the last couple of days. But I think that at the very beginning, we always go back to, well, why are we creating those masks? And if we deviate from why we're creating those masks to start to be about civic discourse, I think then we're making those patients artists, and that's not what's important. What's important to them is healing. And so when we start, where we start is, I think, critically important, but I think we ought to be open to how they can be used in other ways. Yeah, that, um, that open, open to influences that, that Liz uh, suggested earlier. Anyone have a uh, follow-on to that? Yeah. I, um, I'll, 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 I'll piggyback on you. Oh, I don't know if you want to piggyback on me. Oh. I mean, I could clearly carry you, but I'm going to take us totally off road. <laughs> because I keep hearing these conversations about, you know, art um, as though it's a separate entity from the person. So in other words, it's kind of like, oh, there's a person, they're breathing. Look at that. Did you see that? Or they're eating. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Like, this is such a natural part of who we are. Right? So for instance, within um, integrative health and wellness, when people come, I don't, like, I don't immediately assume that they don't take care of themselves. I ask them, how do you take care of yourself? And it's the same thing. I don't assume that you're not creative or an artist. I'd like to know how you are. Because at the end of the day, we're all storytellers. Even Scott, you just told a story, right? We all curate our lives. We are all creative. And every single time we make it into something else, I think we're reinforcing that paradigm that's not helpful. Yeah, so let me ask you then. Uh, <clears throat> as an artist, which is my relationship to this um, work, uh, when I enter, uh, how, how do I express that, uh, both the, my sense of understanding that and my sense of uh, my curiosity about the difference between your experience and how you're going to express it as an artist in my experience. How do, how do I enter in a way that doesn't say, oh, good for you, you're eating, and I'm so surprised that you breathe. How, how, do, how do I enter um, in a way that we start from human? So I guess it would depend on the situation, right? But again, not with the assumption that you don't do these things because it reinforces that idea that it's something separate, right? So art should be an inclusive term and not an exclusive one, right? I mean, there's a difference between being a professional artist, you know, an artist who kind of dabbles, but we are all artists and we're all creative, right? And sometimes, I was talking to Lisa earlier, we use this term like the arts, right? Like that's someone coming and saying, oh, tell me about medicine. Uh, okay, well, medicine is like massive and, you know, <laughs> like somebody comes and say, well, tell me about art. Uh, okay, I, you know, I just, I think sometimes our messaging is not clear and it actually interferes with what we're trying to do, right? So mm -hmm. reminding people that we are creative and it is as natural as breathing and eating. Mm -hmm. If I can, I'm gonna string, try to string two points from that. Um, <laughs> so artwork is an extension of ourselves and, and uh, from our, our therapist's point of view, we use the art to communicate with the patient. Um, same with the music, right? And um, so in the, in the case of National Geographic, um, I had to very carefully choose who was involved in that project. And um, I think it's important for people to know that. They didn't just, I didn't just pick a couple names out of a hat. They had to, they were 
um, less vulnerable. Um, they had to opt into it and, and feel comfortable with it. And you have to also explain to them that they're then out there in society for people to, to judge. Um, but, it, but it also had the, the positive aspects in that um, people became more aware of art therapy as a way to, um, to treat you know, these invisible wounds of war. Um, and it also allowed society to better understand what they were going through, so it validated their experiences, which was a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that plays maybe into the empathy part of this conversation that we're about to get into. Um, and then one more thing uh, about this lonely, loneliness and isolation. So these masks have created a, a community, right, of, for the service members. Community has been strong through this entire, um, you know, event. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also it's shown up in our research. So we researched uh, about 400 of the masks. We've had over 1,400 created. And we saw that, and we correlated it to their incoming post-traumatic stress disorder scores and their generalized anxiety scores. And those service members who symbolized a sense of community, either within their team or within the military or with their families, they had a lo lower score in P of PTSD. Um, so we are able to take that and know then that sense of community is a protective factor. And so loneliness and isolation, not a healthy thing. And the arts, um, they're a great and beautiful way to, to create that sense of community. And we've actually seen service members create teams. There are actual artist teams working together outside of the clinical realm. So it does happen. And um, so I just think this is such an important conversation for us yeah. to have. So. Can I just add on to that as a clinician? Um, I had the opportunity of visiting um, uh, you in Washington just a few weeks ago, and as soon as you are up close and looking at a mask, you can start to understand, having not even met the veteran, some of the things that they're going through. And just looking at those masks, they speak so loudly that that increased my empathy and, and increased my, really prepared me for this conference to, 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 to see the kinds of struggles that, that are expressed through a simple mask, and I think that is building a community. I think that it's difficult for um, us to be thinking, on, you know, that the clinicians are on one side and the patients are on another, and which ones are the artists. And it, let's, I, I think it's as many opportunities we have to either make art together or to discuss art together that breaks down the barriers. And I think there's actually three different uh, dimensions there that we're trying to blend a bit today, which is <coughs> there's the clinicians, there's the patients, and then there's the artists, as though they were separate, right? And, and how do, and as artists, civilian artists, artists with no, no uh, experience with the military, entering this conversation, how do we enter in a place of understanding that we're part of this continuity of, um, you know, this unity? I, I want to let Michelle get in because it was a, a, a bit ago, and then I have a question coming to you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to just touch base on a couple of things uh, with Jeremy and with Melissa and everybody who's talking about. Well, with the VA caregiver program, um, you know, we're an evidence-based program, and um, during the RAND study in 2014, they did um, identify that 53% of the caregivers um, definitely feel isolated. And with that being said, that they're looking for the social support. So with that, Going up to the next level, um, we have a program which is the Peer Support Mentoring Program. Can you talk into the microphone? Uh, which is the Peer Support Mentoring Program, and where uh, caregivers teach other caregivers on a national level. And because of the outcome study, uh, we have found that um, local peer mentoring, one on one, face to face, is more has more of an impact. And uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening, um, you know, and to bring it closer together, uh, peer mentors uh, volunteer uh, around the nation at over 50 organizations. Um, so there's probably some organizations in your community that you're not aware of. Um, and also, um, they uh, walk the walk. And that's one of my sayings that uh, you know we reflect on because they say you can't walk in my shoes, walk the walk, and that's where they you know really are promoting like their education, their knowledge, and really sharing their experiences. And um, what I'm also getting at also is that um, uh, there is um, some of the mentors expressing 
through art therapy, through music therapy, and as a matter of fact, one of my mentors is uh, pretty much a subject matter expert uh, dealing with PTSD and art, uh, and wrote a book. So uh, I'm really, you know, glad to see that this is coming together. And is there a place that we could find that list of 50 and, and uh, we could gather, we don't need to go through the list now, but there's a place that we could get that information and put it into the report here so that people have it. Great. Great. Uh, <clears throat> did you have a response to that, Yeah, Rebecca? just something um, to piggyback um, off that comment. When we were in uh, Creative Forces, we went and held a um, state arts agency meeting in San Diego um, in around uh, Veterans Day last year. And one of, uh, from Combat Arts, one of the artists who's in the community working on bases, um, she's not an art therapist. She's very... Um, eager to say that she's not an art therapist and she works closely with leadership as well. Um, but she said the biggest thing that's helped me, so your question was how do you, what's your in, how do you, how do you access? She said that one of the biggest things that helped me was getting those peer mentors, uh, veterans, who help her to bridge the gap between what she doesn't know, right, her gap in knowledge, um, and what the needs are of that population. So she doesn't have necessarily therapeutic training. Um, she's not a credential <laughs> art therapist. Um, it's supplemental, so um, it's, it's helpful. It's meeting a need because there isn't an art therapist at that base yet. So instead of having no art, they're using their community artists in a way um, that they can bridge that gap, and peer mentoring was a huge part of that. Um, just from my experience working in San Diego um, in the nonprofit sector before I moved into Creative Forces and started working in DC, I've had some great experiences um, with community musicians. Hollywood's right up the road from Pendleton, so I had a lot of eager um, Hollywood musicians <laughs> wanting to partner. Some of those partnerships went really well, um, and some did not. And I would say for you know everything that goes well, those few that did not, and really I, what I saw was exploiting the veteran, it was very problematic. So I think yeah. how it's as long it, we can be inclusive. What you were saying, Dr. Wong, but it's informed inclusivity. People have to be informed. Information sharing. Talk more about the things that w the elements of what was wrong. What went wrong? I mean, I think we we want to make sure that we're surfacing sure. the mistakes as well as the. Um, um, so on a spectrum, everything's a spectrum. Everything's a continuum, <laughs> right? So on on a. <laughs> So on a spectrum, let's start with, I always start with positives. So what went really well, um, programs like Music Corps um, with Arthur Bloom, and he works on bass at Walter Reed, and he brings, he works with patients there, with musicians and music, musician trainers, um, with patients who have a strong clinical team, and he takes them out to perform at Kennedy Center um, for an open audience of, mm -hmm. you know, their peers, you know, the community, the civilian, bridging that divide. Um, to a spectrum where we have some people from Hollywood who are working with service members to record their song and then end up exploiting that with people who shall remain nameless, Billy Ray Cyrus. Um, and <laughs> just, it's on, it's out in public. It's, it, it was, it's okay. It's, okay. it's out it's in public. public it, was, it was on CNN um, where they had this uh, song that was written in a music therapy context and then was very much shifted and then made a music video that was blasted um, across the nation um, to a much more severe end of the spectrum where there is a a songwriting workshop um, that had highlighted a service member who wrote a song called I Can't See the Sunshine about his uh, experience in combat, losing friends, losing um, battalion members. And then after that was, you know, newscast, um, the service member ended up killing himself and the headline read, um, music therapy, veteran engaged in music therapy, commits suicide. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, now that was not music therapy, but again, it was not informed. And that's not that it, the it wasn't right. informed by the um, songwriters. It was just not informed by the media. I want to uh, get to you, Scott. Can, can uh, I pull you in on this? Because yesterday you raised a question very directly about what doors, what triggers, what, right, right, and, no, and how to manage those. And so maybe we could talk a little bit as a table yeah, about no, the management of those. Thanks. No, no, I, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, <laughs> you know, our, our, our patient population is, 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 is very fragile. And just moving to get treatment is courageous. Uh, the warrior ethos sort of prohibits uh, active seeking of care. There, there are efforts to change the culture, and it happens very incrementally, and I think the Intrepid Spirit Center uh, platform is helping raise awareness and allowing folks to step forward and receive care. Uh, I think that you do find inherently therapists and providers, that's my soldier. You know, we, we, that's our soldier, you know, and we're gonna be very careful um, referring out into the community because we know the perils of, of, of potential challenges that may be encountered. And, and that is 
perhaps also due to a lack of understanding as to where are the boundaries, how do things exist within the art community. We're just in the process now of engaging in that, and we have an art therapist on the ground, and after our PTSD groups, uh, either individuals will go to yoga or they'll go to art therapy. And the benefits that are seen, again, as a psychodynamically trained uh, psychologist is so rich, and it's beautiful, and it's amazing. Um, but there are service members that really, they struggle with some of the uh, bringing this material to life. Uh, uh, one quick example uh, is that in some of the art, there was a, a weapon, uh, sui uh, said suicide, and there was a gun to a, a person's head in his uh, uh, art presentation. And we didn't get that information until 48 hours later. That's concerning. That's, that's a challenge. So we have to be communicating, and we have to be talking, and we have to understand the risks. And we may be talking about different patient populations, or different populations. <laughs> patient populations, as well as folks that are out in the community seeking art as a rehabilitative community engagement uh, aspect. So when I, when I talk about our patients, I'm talking about folks that are actively engaged in treatment. And so there are, there are significant risks with that patient population that may be different than some of the folks you guys see in your studios. Great. Did you want to come into that? Yeah. 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 And probably, probably with, I think we're all very, the clinicians are very conscious of the safety issue. Yes. Right. And we're very com conscious that in the broad population of people who have any level of distress is some subset of them who have significant level of distress. Mm -hmm. And it's our obligation to be attentive to the fragility of that subpopulation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and in public health it's often diagrammed out as a, as a pyramid. There's a base of a pyramid with people of mild risk factors, you know, kind of struggle with something, may not even uh, know they have an issue. And then you have middle of the pyramid of people who might have it in a mild way, and then people at the top of the pyramid. Um, that have severe issues. This is true for whether it's diabetes or heart disease or a mental health issue. We have to get much more careful and precise when we start thinking about programming, particularly to the vulnerable population, where we are on the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Because you can actually make a mistake in either direction. You can say, oh, creative arts expression is so precious, it needs to be just targeting the people who have this most significant distress in tightly controlled therapeutic environments. Well, that runs the risk of not exposing or allowing people to benefit from the amazing ability of the arts to just create conversation, build resilience, shared sense of connection, all right. those wonderful things. You know, so we have to find our way, and so it's a very timely um, uh, conversation because if we don't get it right, you know, people kind of move to one direction or the other. They get quite polarized about it, yeah. and then it slows things down. Uh, to both of those points, um, you said. Um, communication and I think that um, to enter into that space with a service member or a veteran it's going to be very important to say art is a very powerful thing and this is going to innately and naturally bring up things for you and and be aware of that both the person facilitating the art but also the veteran or, or service member themselves and to have resources and safety nets within your your community or your local area set up in case they do get to the point where they need to go back into the clinical space. And a, a good example of that is um, an art therapist we work with down at Fort Belvoir, who um, she assists her, she's with her, with many of the patients that she's treating in a non-clinical setting in the community and they do ceramics together. And she explains to them, listen, this is not therapy time, but if something comes up to you during this, during this experience, we can, we'll, we can talk about it back in the, um, and the space. And the other thing I need to say is that um, I think that you bring up a very good point, and it was in the reentry conversation earlier too. That um, a lot of these service members, they feel like if they do open up in the clinical space, they're going to lose their their job or rank or um, security clearance, and so they are a little more comfortable sometimes outside of that realm, um, opening up. And so we have to remind ourselves of that. Um, but then. I've worked with another organization who made sure, and I know this doesn't always work because I heard it yesterday, um, that there was a creative arts therapist in the room during the workshop, um, and they, they wove art and music and writing through, through the, it was the theme of the, of the workshop. But the, the creative arts therapist wasn't there to interject or they were part of the process. And that was a, a, a train the trainer situation where the veterans were actually helping lead and then they trained the other veterans through the future workshops. And it felt, like I said, there was a safety net. It felt. Um, 
It was all inclusive and it felt very safe. So. Can I switch topics for just a second? I know, Port and we can come back to it if there's something unsaid or we can get to it on the, on the outer circle, but I want to raise another thing that comes right out of this. And Brittany, I think I'm going to poke at you for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> we, we've heard a lot um, thus far, which I've found very provocative, about reframing the notion of the, uh, the vet as a victim, the, the vet as a patient that needs help and that the arts can come and help. Um, and reframing that to how do the arts and the strengths and the, the training and the, and the purpose-driven life of a, of a veteran, how do those things come together to create value? Um, and so in this conversation where we focus so much about coming in to help, can you d talk about um, your own experience of, of where you feel art and, and your experience as a veteran um, come together? I can try. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think a lot of what Melissa was saying is very important that everyone has their own experience and some people value having another veteran in the room, kind of help them collaborate, accept, experience things together and some of them don't want that at all. I've been around veterans who cannot be in uniform anymore and they can't be around people in uniform and treatment won't happen unless everyone in uniform leaves the room. And I've had cases where um, I had to go home and, or bring civilian clothes to work with me, change the civilian clothes, and then go meet someone at a cafe off base or whatever, because they, weren't, they were just not able to communicate or speak to me in any way if I was in uniform. I had to like, pretend that I wasn't in the military. Um, so I think there's, there's different situations and everyone has their own experiences. Um, and that's always, that, that's something that's good to understand and value, and anyone who's working with the veteran or military community, that's, that's a good thing to be trained in, I guess. Um, but on the flip side, it is good to have a peer veteran around with you to kind of translate or to have that language so, you, there's, so there is no barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to get at one other thing that we had um, talked about first, and then, then we can go wherever we have time to go. Uh, and I'm going to point this at you, Dr. Wong. The, uh, the, we've also talked a lot about the difference between the professional artist and um, the veteran. Um, and we have talked about the fact that many are both. Uh, and we've talked about the, the, uh, the projects that involve practice, where the veterans are actually the creative artists in the project, and then where the project is created by artists who represent the experience of the veteran. Uh, is there a, a distinction in your mind in terms of the value or the role of either of those um, places to stand, where it, whether it's engaged uh, participation of the veterans in the creative process, or more, yesterday we talked about it in terms of audience, more as um, the receivers or whose stories are being represented. Is there a value um, difference there or different uh, effectiveness, different ways to deploy them? What would you say is going on in that? Yeah, I, th I think both of them are, are very valid. I think uh, Liz Lerman referred to um, the process to the product. And I was thinking about that actually in terms of Music Corps with Arthur Bloom's group, where those musicians uh, may be double or triple amputees, but they are musicians first. And they will practice for eight to 10 hours a day, or they'll jam for hours, um, during which time, as a neuroscientist or a physician, you're seeing that their executive function is improving and their occupational therapy is not necessary because they're practicing fingering on their guitar or their piano. And all of those things are happening in the process of something beyond themselves. And I was thinking about that as, you know, just, Overall, what are we doing as we are looking for a purpose-driven life? Um, I was talking to people yesterday who are saying, you know, our life doesn't stop as being veterans after the war. It, it, what, is, what is going to go on for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of our life? And where does our direction go with our new identity or our, our built identity? That's true for all of us who have had a trauma of any sort. Um, but the arts is one of those things where you can never you can never win. You can never get to the, the absolute uh -huh. pinnacle of art because art is always beyond you and it gives you something to strive for at all moments. You know, Even if you say play the same concerto, it sounds different next year when you have a different life experience. Or if, you do, if you're in a play a hundred times around the country, each performance is different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that's going back to the point of we are all you know, a, a single population and, and just helping 
uh, reintegrate so that we're all moving in that same population is what's, what's really key. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a, a, another question about mutuality. I think, uh, Captain, if you don't mind, uh, we, is there equivalency in your mind between the skills? We've heard the different skills. The, uh, we've used the term warriors uh, as, and uh, artists. Uh, the, in this conversation, are you feeling that we're on, we're in the Liz Lerman balance place in terms of the skills that the warriors bring to the conversation and the skills that the artists bring to the conversation. Is that balance even important as we're entering these projects? And how are we doing as a field in your experience of us with that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's interesting that you use the word skills. And so I will answer your question, but probably not actually answer it and just answer the question that I think I heard you say. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, because in my work, I deal with skills all the time. I mean, that's what health and wellness is about, is providing people with those skills that they need to be healthy and well, right? So the skill of self-awareness, because it is a skill, right? Sometimes it takes us to places that are very uncomfortable. But the more you do it, sometimes the easier it gets, right? So those are the skills. And I totally agree that it really is the process. I mean, that is at the end of the day, exactly what it's about. So for instance, at Walter Reed, we have artists in healthcare who work on the inpatient unit, right? They are, um, you know, they're not creative arts therapists, so they don't intentionally kind of evoke traumatic memories, um, but they're artists who've received specialized training. And so they are literally just there to acknowledge that moment and capture it. That's it, it's a single data point you don't need to do anything with it if you don't want to. There's no product. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, and so those are the skills that I think everybody needs, right? And so for instance, when we were singing, because Melissa and Rebecca and I sing from time to time, um, I'm an alto. And the beautiful thing about being an alto is that you can't be an alto by yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, you can't. <laughs> You can be a soprano by yourself, right? <laughs> you can't be an alto by yourself, right? So, I mean, those around us are really important for us understanding who we are. Um, and I think that also speaks to the community piece. So I don't know if that answers your question. It, it but starts it, to. I, yeah. I, my question was probably a little bit more um, concerned about whether or not in this particular conversation we have equivalency in terms of impo which, which are more important. Uh, and, I, and so I'm getting at this dynamic of, we come in to help. As artists, we come in to help, and so our skills are being brought into the equation. And, and hearing at this table, actually the work is already going on and we can come in to serve it, is probably the better place to come in. So I think this, uh, this touches on what I was wanting to say earlier, which is uh, some of the people that I've seen who have been in this space for a while from the art side, uh, places like Impart, um, if anybody's seen the video, it's a, they do blacksmithing and pottery with people who have gone through uh, the, the Creative Forces program at, at Fort Belvoir. There's a Hot Shop Heroes glass blowing. Um, and I've, I saw this in the second piece of KJ's yesterday and I, and I wanna talk to her about that. Because th this also happened in the writing program that we've been doing for about five years where initially we were very eager to get into the drama. <laughs> Um, and there was some good um, background on uh, James Pennebaker, a psychologist who's done expressive writing that really focused on trauma. But as we got into a conversation with him, we started to think maybe our role is meaning making, sense making, and it, we can actually, and this is the content shaping thing that I was alluding to earlier, let's go ahead and steer ourselves to be where we can feel comfortable um, if there is going to be something deep and heavy, um, survivor guilt or some other um, existential issue, in this setting, I'd rather the creative arts therapist be the one kind of managing that. And I noticed that in KJ's piece where um, re-entry, which I love, and I've you know known as it was being built, but really experiencing it again, it was very moving. Um, but I did notice you know that there was a lot of anger, there was a lot of uh, uh, PTSD kinds of issues. Um, and then the subsequent piece that she was really thinking about creating to have a conversation with Navy medical people was a much different kind of set of tone and themes. Uh, the Navy chap, you know, every time he opened his mouth, I'm like, now what's he going to say? And I think this gets back to this thing that keeps up coming up over and over again about, sorry, I looked at outside the circle, um, <laughs> about uh, stigma. And I think, you know, for me, what I've really gained an appreciation of is that um, 
if you think about it in terms of Eugene O'Neill, some people have heard me say this a lot, but his, his sense of the, his life purpose as being pulling back the veil on the mysteries that drive the human condition. I think if we really understand that the wartime experiences has given people who have gone through that an unfair advantage in pursuing that work, mm. then we're not looking at it as an illness, we're looking at it as meaning making and, in spot, and insight. Yeah. And when we come into these spaces safely, if we could just be thinking, you know, a safe way to come in is to, to steer insight towards the kinds of proactive things that they're groping for, rather than rumination on the kinds of things that we might find fascinating but might not be the healthiest thing for us Great. all to sit in. I'm gonna pause and we're gonna go to the circle, but Sarah, you have the first question. Okay, so let's go to that. Let's, uh, Who's got the um, mics? And Sarah, go ahead and, and make your comment. I'm sorry to cut yeah, you off, but we're so running out we, of time. So the only thing I was going to kind of piggyback onto what Bill was saying, and I think it's so important and why this dialogue that we're having together as a community is so incredibly important is because we're sitting there talking as healthcare providers about what's happening, but less than 50% of the people who are suffering from PTSD and traumatic brain injury actually go into the healthcare setting. Mm -hmm. And so they go into communities, and that is why this is such an important dialogue, because this healing happens out in the communities, and the more we can learn together and, and learn from each other how to address this is, is so important. So I just wanted to really point that out, because we're only talking about those who come see us, yeah. um, and there's a lot more. Yeah. You have the microphone. And thank you for that. That's a good introduction to what I was going to say just now. Um, you asked a question about um, going within the community to the veterans and helping, right? Them. So this is the, the thing that, for me personally, as a veteran, when I went to Carpetbag, they weren't helping me with art. They created a space where I could be heard and they were listening. That's what it was. For me, it wasn't art. I was sitting in a circle with people who appeared to care and had a mutual understanding because the, the question in the center of the circle was related to being a veteran or knowing or associating with someone that was a veteran. And every story that was told was that. And when it came to me, I was able to share my story. So it wasn't an art, it was a listening you know, that community and someone was listening and waiting to hear me, finally. Okay, uh, hands up if you have a, and I just wanna, um, I wanna encourage people, this is the part of the process where some of you have been sitting in the listening mode for a really long time at this point, uh, you know, more than a day, uh, and you're, you're sitting on things that, that need to get into the room. So I really wanna encourage those of you who haven't yet to share the things that are, you're even afraid to share <laughs> or are, are unformed. If you haven't yet had an opportunity to do that, this, sometimes they call this about step up your participation and step up your listening. So if you're someone who tends to participate, step up your listening. And if you're someone who tends to not participate, we really need that from you because you're holding things that need to get into the room. So go ahead. So as someone who's participated, maybe. That's okay. Okay. You, uh, you made the announcement <laughs> after, so. Yeah, right. You already had the Don't. <laughs> This is not about shaming, this is just about encouraging the <laughs> I thought you were looking at me when you said that. Yeah. Um, so I did, in uh, one thing you said, Melissa, thinking about the safety net around us, and I know we've talked about that a lot, I think in there is there an, is there an implicit assumption that there is that safety net. Um, and I know a lot of us have communities that we work with that that creative arts therapist might not be there, right? Doesn't have to be. So I guess my question is how, as community service providers, uh, what are the resources that we should be looking into as uh, potential safety nets if there's not a, a creative forces therapist in the area? Um, where, where do we go as someone when we cross that line and someone needs more support? Uh, where, do we, where do we lead them? Um, I don't actually know if I can, because okay. I will be endorsing, but I'm gonna whisper something in her ear and also let her complete her thought. Um, no, I'm just kidding, well, sort of. I think some of it, um, what was that? I think. I, How is it that the most performance is happening with the... the, the, the I think that uh, some of it has to do with the training ahead of time, Sam, and it's, it's, it's again about intention, it's about being prepared for those sorts of things and not waiting until you need it to know where it is. So I think 
when you're going into a situation being, uh, you know, a lot of times we call it in medicine, we call it informed consent, um, making sure that you're giving people kind of a clear understanding of what they're about to engage in so that they can choose whether or not to do it or not and be prepared, having those resources. I think across um, multiple communities, there are lots of different places that are federal that will support that, be that the Department of Defense or Veterans Health Centers and vet clinics and all the different things that exist out there. But there are also a lot of um, nonprofit organizations for healthcare. Uh, Given Hour is a great organization I can go ahead and support. Is that the one you said? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I didn't even know that. Um, but another, you know, there are a number of them. And I think that if you're in a community and you're starting to do this work, you should know that know where your safety net is before you engage so that you know where to go to. Know where your safety net is I, before I, you engage. I totally agree to that or with that. I think that if if you just let them know you're there, the VA, the MTFs, and then the resources in the area, hey, I'm in your area and I'm working with your, your people, right? The, the people that are supposed to be, not supposed to be, but could be coming to you. And it, it's, if you create a dialogue with them and let them know, where do I go if something comes up, right? Just start, start that, that relationship with them. I think that, that would be good. Jeremy. So I'll stay on this very practical theme of what we could provide as guidance to, um, to groups like like yours, and um, certainly agree with everything that's been said. There's also a growing awareness that some of the core skills you need when you're in the community, I'm talking about working at the, you know, that kind of base of the pyramid. People are mostly okay most of the time, but could get triggered by something, even though they're not severely distressed. Um, UCLA Arts and Health Program has kind of been looking at this for a while, and they've developed a training program a 20 or 30 hour, I don't know exactly what it is, training program, mostly for artists who want to work in you know, various group activities to just train them in facilitation skills, recognizing something that may be a problem and refer out. Mm -hmm. And so it, again, let's stay away from the binary, which is either someone's really sick and then you need, they need a therapist or um, you know, then you know, maybe we just uh, ignore them or, or provide fairly non-provocative conversations and the risk you run with a non-provocative conversation is it'll miss it. Yeah. It'll miss the opportunity to really connect and share. And so I think we're going to see, you know, other ways to put safety into these scenarios and some of it could be these relatively, you know, almost certificate programs because there's an enormous amount of positive energy from the art world. The artists want to get involved. And by the way, it's not just for veterans, it's with older adults, it's with caregivers, it's with minorities. There's a lot of trauma out there. And if we require that you have to be a licensed therapist to deal with trauma, we're gonna be behind. Yeah. I just want, while you have the mic, just uh, a quick question. Um, uh, your um, research around loneliness, what I was hearing and connecting to, and I wanna make sure I got it right, is that community is actually uh, a kind of treatment for loneliness. Like the, 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 the elements of this work that create community are actually uh, at the core of Absolutely. Yes. Okay. You know, it, you know, if the illness, so to speak, metaphorically is um, loneliness, what's the antidote? <laughs> uh, and it's connection yeah. and right. connection at an authentic level. And it, and it very much ties to what we've been talking about for the last day and a half. Great. And Michelle had uh, was, was hoping for the um, mic, but I have one behind me, too. Oh, good. Uh, sorry. Nolan. OK. Um, I think I heard uh, oh. Sam, uh, your question about you know, how to partner out a little bit. I think that you have to use the creativity um, that you have as individuals. And um, not only start from like a local setting, for example, um, your colleges, get a seat on you know, the presidential board of the Department of Higher Education in your towns, uh, in your state. Uh, then move out to, you know, the American Legions, the vet centers, and then also establish a task force committee and bring in, invite the community into your organization. And it really works. Great. Thank you. That's a test one. Yeah. Is it working? It. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great, uh, great comment. I, I just like to tag into that plus the previous comment. So the question uh, kind of precedes this idea of resource, right? There's a, there's a need for resource. And so the point that I have observed is that there's resource on both sides of the arts community, but there's also a resource on the military side. And this is why I think connection is so critical. Uh, I often share with, with Marita this idea that what you're really trying to do in bridging the two communities is really, uh, and I did a, a short piece for, uh, I think, uh, Jane, create an organic ecosystem 
that becomes self-fulfilling and self-sustaining. But this is where I think from a structural perspective, you know, and I'm just going to label it local arts agency because it could be really anyone. Someone has to kind of from a community perspective say, who's going to take the initiative to start drawing this organic ecosystem together, right? So that if I'm out there, an artist doing something, I have a resource I can go to and say, yes, this to uh, your question about endorsement. It doesn't become an endorsement issue then. It becomes a, a, a awareness of where those resources are if I find myself in a gap, right? The second point of this about the connection is that once you do that, it, it enables the military to peep into that and see how their resources could also be tapped and fulfill it on the other end of the spectrum, right? So I think this whole idea of creating an organic ecosystem where it becomes self-fulfilling and also self-sustaining, and structurally those things can be easily, I think, implemented. Great. But that's, that's more of a long-term community engagement uh, connection perspective. And, and tomorrow when we get into these uh, breakout groups, the, the uh, degree to which you guys can uh, detail some of the networks that you know or some of the programs that you know, that's going to be helpful to capture uh, tomorrow's breakouts. Yeah, Dr. Wong. Um, uh, just briefly, the, the, on the civilian side here in Boston, we have something called the Boston Arts Consortium for Health. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a... Uh, grassroots group of about seven years of age now, but we have people from Berkeley School of Music, New England Conservatory, the Museum of Fine Arts, the medical schools and universities, and so we're all sharing knowledge. The neuroscientists know stuff that the clinicians need to know, um, and now the city of Boston is looking into its departments to see what arts programs are in their own departments. Um, and in a addition, uh, there's a program at the VA called My Life, My Story, where they're getting the stories of the veterans and just slipping it into the charts of the, of the patients. It's a non-clinical story, but it, it, it gives somebody a, a lot more insight and empathy into that. And so I think the whole thing about getting stories and across a wide network uh, is, is what, it, it's, it's something that's really replicable in other communities. Great, and Rebecca had a... Um, I just wanted to point out that the Boston Arts Consortium for Health is the acronym of Bach, Bach. sorry, I think that's <laughs> right. Uh, uh, since we're talking about acronyms today. Um, music nerd, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to kind of um, go back to the continuum and um, a comment that you were saying before Dr. Wong um, at the table um, and Dr. Engel about um, whether it's artwork that's really informing um, psychological health and behavioral health rounds, um, or whether uh, it's those musicians and music corps that are practicing or in music therapy practicing something in their motivation. The arts are very powerful, also very motivating. Um, and just really understanding how we inform ourselves in the medical community, but how um, an art exhibit, a display, um, a, those strategic um, selected masks that were put into National Geographic. Like you said that comment, that a simple mask, which you know could be complex or simple, can paint a picture and you really get to know that person. And I think um, just tying into our artistry as visual artists, as uh, the theater dancers, musicians, poets, writers, um, the power of performance and how we can use performance to really inform um, that gap we were talking about in the previous panel, the military civilian gap, but how through the power of performance um, we can inform each other, we can inform veterans um, as participants or audience members, and we can just inform communities at large. Mm -hmm. Judy. I just want to say that I'm Judy Smith from Access Dance Company in Oakland, that I think there's a really big resource that's being missed here, and it's the disability community especially for veterans with disabilities. And my experience is that the veterans are not taking advantage of the information and the wealth of knowledge um, available through independent living resources and other disability organizations, because a lot of us have been living with this shit for you know 30 years, 40 years. And we know a lot about how to navigate disability and how to navigate um, accessibility. So. You know, I would encourage um, people to start looking towards the disability community because, you know, uh, we were in Siberia in 1995 and having some issues um, getting my wheelchair batteries charged and decided we'd put them in a Fiat and drive them around for the day and then swap <laughs> them out at night. And just Bonnie, who's one of our original founding members, said disability is actually the mother of invention. <laughs> Very nice. 
Yeah, there's one. Uh, who's back there? Sorry, I can't see you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I'm Madeline from oh, the Flynn hi. Center. Um, I wanted to thank this, um, this group. Um, it's really been the uh, session that's blown it up out of the edges for me because um, I've been having a hard time, I've been thinking a lot and having a hard time commenting because I, didn't f I don't feel like an expert in the, in the military or veteran community. I have my father's veteran, but I drag him to modern dance, so I've already got that. Um, so, so this was really the session that made it feel like um, this works for every community, not just military and veterans. And what Judy said, um, one thing we're working on at the Flynn is working on accessibility um, with different communities um, in the disability, different populations in the disability community. And one thing we've been working on is audiences, um, kids and adults on the spectrum. And one thing we've noticed that is, um, is that all the adaptations and, and things we've done have made it have made it wonderful for these populations, but more inclusive for all of our audiences. Um, and so it's really um, become universal, become that ecosystem that you were talking about, that organic ecosystem that's growing. And so I really wanted to thank everybody for this session um, that's starting to seep it out into all of those other disenfranchised communities that we're as arts presenters, as artists, as um, are, are trying to connect with. I'd like to ask the group a question. Uh, this table started with um, the land acknowledgement, which we had done yesterday, and then uh, sang the national anthem. And I'd love to hear responses. Yeah. Colleen Jennings Rogensack from Arizona State University Gamage. It, it was really interesting to me because I'm a Rotarian, and so every Friday we have lunch, we sing the Star Spangled Banner. But I used to always sit next to Dmitry Dorbachevsky. He was a classical violinist from Paris. His father died in the camps. He and his bling, he escaped, his brother escaped, the rest of the family was killed. And we would sing that song and then Dmitry would whisper in our, my ear, as we got to the end, with liberty and justice for all, and he would whisper, almost. And whenever I hear the Star Spangled Banner, I hear Dimitri whispering my ear. And it's both a comment of condemnation, but it's also a comment of hope that, that it, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. So I, I want to thank you for letting us say that, but I know we all come to the Star Spangled Banner with a lot of different feelings. Yeah, and that's why I want to bring them in. Uh, the, Kita has her hand up. Uh, anybody behind me? And Margaret? Um. That was a very difficult moment for me, personally. Mm -hmm. As um, an indigenous person, um, I love the beauty of the song. I love, I also, I come from a family of singers. So the difficulty of that piece technically resonates with me very highly. Um, but it was very difficult and I think I was probably the only person in the room who did not stand. You didn't. Well, aside, yeah. who was physically able to stand <laughs> and who did not stand because that was a moment of conflict for me personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to, I, I acknowledge what you're saying and I have that um, moment inside too, although I did stand and I love to sing it. Um, but the last time I sang it was last month in my own community during um, a large for Hanover march uh, against the immigration ban and as we ended the march and took over the entire Dartmouth Green holding hands, so a gigantic circle, um, a young man in a, in a beefed up truck drove by with his windows open blasting that song which we instantly all began to sing with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, back here. Uh, I'm Rob Richter from Connecticut College and, and I, when we, the Star Spangled Banner, I can't remember the last time I've heard it or, or sung it. Um, and so it was jarring for me. Um, and seated next to Kita, I almost wanted, I've, I debated standing. It was sort of, do I? I it, it, was, it was a decision that had mm -hmm. to be made. Mm -hmm. and, and looking around the room and in a hand to heart, and I have my hands in my pocket, and I'm like, am I being inappropriate? 
Oh, so it was just, it was an interesting, yeah. it was an interesting thought-provoking moment. Uh, uh, Captain McGuire, uh, can I ask you, how does it, um, st how did these comments, or the, 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 I mean, this must come up, uh, and uh, how, does, how does this resonate for you? What, uh, what would be your um, comment about it? Again, these are my own personal yes, thoughts. Yes, your personal don't thoughts. Don't represent Thank in you. any way. <laughs> um, I actually love it um, because, you know, someone mentioned, I think earlier today, um, the hesitation, or maybe it was Maurice, the hesitation in um, expressing views that were contrary, right, um, to the way they're presented through the military and that it might be unpatriotic. And I thought to myself, there's nothing more patriotic, right, than pushing and questioning and saying, hold on a minute, no way, hell no. Um, and so for us, it is, I do, I love singing, we sing all the time, I'm always looking for an opportunity to do it, I'll sing anything. Um, <laughs> and, um, and of course, you know, we start all of our, like, you know, ceremonies and with the Star Spangled Banner, it's just a part of, like, the military culture. Um, but it's very true that a lot of people don't actively think about what that experience is like for other people. I had something to say. That's why I'm holding on. Right? <laughs> okay, yeah, but I'm going to take it from you for the moment for someone who hasn't spoken it here, and then we'll go there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to... So from the perspective of an Army musician, um, I've been singing the National Anthem for 11 years, and it came to a point in my career where it was like brushing your teeth something that you do every day. It's, it's like a ritual and it just happens and there's no feelings and y y it just, it's off the cuff, it just happens. So it was natural um, for a long time. And it was, I mean, if you are in uniform and you don't salute and you don't recognize the flag during the anthem or whenever you're supposed to recognize the flag or render a hand salute, it's like burning a flag. It's like, it's totally taboo, you don't do it, you will get pinned down for it. And then I was a first responder in the Boston Marathon bombings, and the next, uh, like three days later, I was forced to sing the national anthem at Fenway Park down the street with a crowd of people around me, and they announced that I was one of the first responders and I'm in uniform and I'm just having all of these emotions because of what I had just been through and since that day has just never been the same for me. So I struggle with being a person in the military and also being in the civilian world with when I hear that and it just, it will never, it will never be the same again and I'm sure a lot of the veterans in the room have the same experience. Good. Uh, can I get the mic here? Uh, who, yeah, so one here, one here, and then we'll go back there and over there. Real, real quick, I've got um, a similar question about, um, about the liminality of being in the civilian world and being a, being a veteran that you, you're still connected to the military through your past, but you're also you know, living in the civilian world, and so you have no real present claim on being military. And, and every time that I hear the Star Spangled Banner, um, my question is, do I put my hand on my heart? Do I salute? You know, what am I, where, where is my position in this? Um, you know, and of course, as a, as a scholar and, and a critical thinker, I, I, you know, I've also got all of the, the implications of what the Star Spangled Banner is, you know, for Native, for uh, African American, for, you know, all of the, all of the different, um, you know, implications that it has over the colonialist meanings um, and so there is, it's, it, it, it stirs up a lot of emotion, but at the same time, it, it, it is an automatic response um, at this point. And it's something that I grew up with, and it's something that as a military person, every single day at 6.30, you were standing, waiting for, you know, for uh, Reveille to go off and to stand at, at, at attention and, you know, and all of these things that happen that kind of build these automatic responses in your body. Um, and so it is. It's, it's a liminality. It's a position of liminality that I haven't quite digested yet. Mm -hmm. So over here, and then it's. Uh, I didn't expect this issue to come up here, and um, but it was. One, it's one of the hardest issues of my transit, personal transition from service member, 22 years in the uniform, to being uh, what I am today. And uh, one of the things as a retiree, we can, we can wear our uniforms. 
um, at, at formal functions and things and our ribbons. And uh, I have made a decision to never wear my, the, the uniform again. Uh, I've dedicated my life to serving in the uniform and out of the uniform in the military, yet I don't feel I, I should ever wear the uniform again. Uh, I keep one in the closet for my funeral. If I, um, I don't know why, but I do. Um, uh, the other point about the, about the national anthem, it was it was just a professional ritual. It was never a thought. It was something that is part of the culture of the profession. I raised my I took an oath to that. Um, now I'm outside of my oath. Uh, I have since internalized that that song. To, to and I have faces of of soldiers that I had known, loved, and fought with that died. And that song now is a testament to them, not necessarily what it was about the country or, or its founding. Uh, so it, to me, that's a, a, a tribute song to, to three specific people that I'm, uh, and that helps me get through that song and then honor it. So I touch my heart because I'm touching them, not, not doing a, a rote ritual. Interesting. Can you pass that down? Here, it's coming down too. And then I had, I had uh, Mike and uh, Victoria would be the next two. And then, oh, I missed you back there, yeah. So can you give that back to him and then we'll go Mike and, and Victoria. The reason I struggle with hierarchy is it's singular. And when it flips, it's still singular. And I think what we're hearing here is that each of us, it was so much more than a singular. So when things happen, which of our, which how do we handle the multiplicity of who we are? You didn't leave the room, Kinta. You stayed in the room. And that, to me, is the expression of community. It's not that we're all going to do the same thing at the same time in precisely the same way. It's that we agree to be in here and work that out. I'm Jewish, raised by an adamantly ecstatic Jewish father who, you know, at Christmas time, he would say, OK, don't sing the Christmas carols. Just sit there. And then, and then he relented. He said, OK, you can sing, but don't say the word Jesus. This, this took like four, four years. <laughs> Then I'm old enough, and many people, some people in this room remember when the, when the Pledge of Allegiance they added under God. Now, my father totally believed in God, but not in school. So then we had to not say that part, but we could say the other part. But I see that as an education in nuance and a, 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 a commitment to participation. So for me, the fact that you want, people in this room wanted to sing that was such a beautiful thing, and I felt I could stand, I didn't need to sing. But this is the practice of living in this, in this other uh, circular, horizontal world to allow us to be those multiple selves, I think. Let's go back there, and then we'll, it, uh, the, we'll go to Mike and then Victoria. So, yeah. um, my, my views on, on service and freedom have changed a bit since leaving the Army 10 years ago. Um, and I just have, I've kind of grown to wonder um, those who defend freedom, what those freedoms are, who those freedoms are for. Um, I was part of the Veterans for Standing Rock uh, group that went to North Dakota in December. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and it was a very powerful experience. Uh, it, was, it felt like a hallowed ground. It was, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. It was community on another level that I had never experienced before. One thing I noticed quickly was how patriotic the Native Americans, the Lakota, I mean, I met, I met indigenous folks from all over the world, but um, they were extremely patriotic. I mean, I saw more Marine Corps hats at Standing Rock than, you know, any other veteran group or place I've ever been in. Uh, what I felt was this idea of coming together and what community means. So I felt that when we did, when we did the, uh, that here, um, but this idea of questioning, it makes me, with my personal experiences, wonder, like, is that good or bad or right or wrong? And I'm trying to make peace with the idea that questioning is okay. So I just wanted to share that. I'm, I was surprised that that came up and that we were going to sing. I'm sorry. Did yeah, I step yeah. on? That the song came up and that we were going to sing it and... We sang it. Uh, I personally sing it and put my hand on my heart because my dad served in the military and he was in Germany for four years and uh, he was in the Marine Corps Reserve. But I wanted to say that um, um, 
I want to honor every single opinion on what happened in this room, and it is an example for me. The stark, what hit me in talking about this is, this is a very clear, stark example, to put in more political terms what Liz just said, of this is exactly the forum, the kind of forums we need to create out in the community, outside of our arts community, where it's okay to not have the same opinion. You, we're not screaming at each other, but the, I completely respect the opinions I've heard. And so, for me, it's United States of America, love it or leave it? No, love it or change it. To your point, several times over the past day, so it did to, and also to Colleen's point, it gave me some hope because that's the kind of discourse we should create everywhere we possibly can because healthy democracy needs all these different voices. It was hopeful. Uh, I just want to um, thank you all for this experience of being in community. And I just wanted to add that, David, your question about the experience feels to me like one of those exercises of what it means to make art together, that singing in that moment is uh, an enactment of a ritual um, in which, again, we have all had so many different experiences, but a catalyst then to bring us together in that very process of differentiation and um, sharing. So thank you for that. Can I just say one thing really quickly? The interesting thing is <laughs> the original plan was for Rebecca and Melissa and I to sing. And then Lisa said, oh, I've got my violin. Like we'd even picked out the key that we were gonna sing in. So we weren't envisioning it as a sing-along, yeah. right? So then when everybody stood up, I was like, oh, well, isn't this interesting? <laughs> and I do think it's interesting. I think it happened for the exact reason that it should have. And I think it also speaks to the beauty of this event today. Like this has been, I go to these events a lot. This has been one of the most significant and genuine experiences that I perhaps have ever had within the arts and military conversation. It is just, and it is hopeful because of that genuine quality that people can say exactly what they want. You know, that's patriotism. And it's just, it's been a beautiful experience. Thank you, everybody. We're going to uh, break here. No, that's just me. <laughs> we, have to, we have to break here. Um, so continue this conversation with each other. But part of the reason that I wanted to make sure we discussed it is because it's really at the core of part of how we're diverse in this room, even though we all agree on the value of art, there are lots of different opinions about uh, many things related to the subject. So uh, thank you all for engaging the conversation. Thank you for um, your attention. <laughs>